Hey, good morning. Today we're going to talk about the sort of mishmash of different RNA things having to do with modifications, but also some of the ways in which RNA can be regulated. Okay, so here's our general picture of a eukaryotic cell, where of course the DNA is located in the nucleus, where transcription occurs. As a result of various processing events, we eventually create an RNA that it can be exported to the cytosol, where it can then be translated. So the picture sort of lies to us in a way. It makes us think the RNA is just kind of hanging out basically by itself, but that is certainly not true, that at all stages of its life cycle, the RNA is actually associated with many, many different proteins that carry out various aspects of the life cycle. Even early on, we have, of course, the cap binding complex. We have proteins that are involved in splicing. We have proteins that are involved in export and binding the poly A tail, and finally the ribosome. So the mRNA is never lonely, it's always got proteins that are associated with it at all times. And the other thing we don't think about that much, we think about transcription and how we can make the RNA and send it out to the cytosol. But in fact, there are many steps in the life cycle of an RNA that can be controlled and regulated, often in very complicated ways. So first of all, of course, we have transcriptional control where a gene can be on or off, so a gene may not be transcribed at all. The mRNA may not be produced. We also have to process the RNA, and that can be done in different ways. We also have to get it out the nucleus, and that can be done selectively. We also have the issues of once it's out there, it doesn't live forever. The RNA will eventually become degraded, or else it will become translated at that point. Okay, so there's many, many steps which are regulated and controlled by various protein, protein factors. Okay, so I think I just said this. Gene expression can be regulated at any step, and there are a lot of different mechanisms for that for post-transcriptional regulation at various points in the life cycle. All right, so post-transcriptional regulation takes in a lot of processes. So anything during or after the mRNA can count as one of these. One very important process is alternative or alternate splicing. So this is a method by which eukaryotes can get more variety of proteins from a single pre-mRNA because there is choice about which exons are included versus excluded from a particular final version that's going to form the mRNA, mature mRNA, that will be translated. So the different forms of the protein that can be produced are called isoforms. So as a result, we can get a lot more different proteins or a more diverse proteome from the mere 30,000 or so protein coding genes that we have. And it's, it's estimated in human that 90% or more even of our pre-mRNAs will produce different final mature mRNAs with the possibility of many, many different protein isoforms. Okay, so this slide represents an example, a theoretical example of alternative splicing. We're starting off with one long pre-mRNA, which has six potential exons, and the process of splicing will choose selectively some of these to include or exclude. So one possibility is, of course, to splice all of them so that you get exons one, two, three, four, five, six all together in one pre-mRNA. But this particular mRNA doesn't seem to do that. For example, we will have one version where we have exons 1, 2, 4, 5, 6, with 3 being skipped to produce a protein, which is la lacking the amino acids encoded by exon 3. Or else we could skip exon 2 and 4 and make an RNA made out of 1, 3, 5, and 6, etc. So the idea, of course, is that we have different choices for exons and that produces different forms of proteins, given the original pre-mRNA can make different proteins. Okay, so this choice is often made by protein splicing factors. The spliceosome is complex enough, but so is splicing is so amazingly complicated in higher organisms that many, many other protein factors called splicing factors are involved in the production of the final mRNA. And we're going to have protein proteins that are splicing factors, but
but also sequence elements within the pre-mRNA that determine efficiency and location of splicing. So we will see that um, examples later of how that is very important for some processes. Okay. Before we do that, we want to talk about RNA degradation. The idea is that RNA, many mRNAs don't last too long in the cell. They're often degraded shortly after they're made and translated, whereas others have much longer half-lives. So this lifetime or half-life life control is an example of a post-transcriptional control. So part of the mechanism whereby um, mRNAs are degraded include deadenylation, decapping, nuclease digestion, endoribonuclease cleavage, etc. And there are many, many proteins involved in these processes. So looking at an mRNA, a final mRNA, one often the first step in degradation is the removal of the poly A tail, shown here by this little Pac-Man kind of thing. So that's one possible start point for degradation. Following the removal of the poly A tail, you can have 3' prime to 5' prime exonuclease digestion, where the exosome starts at the 3' prime end and chews its way in. Alternatively, you can have decapping, where the 5' prime cap is removed, and that is followed by then 5' prime to 3' prime exonuclease digestion. So there are several pathways by which RNA is degraded, and there are mechanisms that control the rate of degradation relative to particular RNAs. Okay, so you don't need to know all these protein complexes, but just be aware that these are complexes that, that control or carry out the various steps in RNA degradation. So for us, we don't need to know the names of all these proteins, but we can just call it the deadenylation complex or the exosome complex or something like that. Okay, so I want to talk about two of the forms of control over mRNA degradation and translation. Okay, we're going to talk a little bit about microRNA binding. These are tiny RNAs, which they have very important regulatory roles, mainly in RNA stability, degradation, and translation. Okay, and they, are, they do this by base pairing with their target RNAs. The other I want to talk about is modification by M formation of M6A methylation and the presence of methylated um, bases, nucleoc nucleosides, within the RNA can alter uh, or control many, many aspects of the RNA life cycle, including translation, stability, um, splicing, etc. Okay, so here's a picture of a pre-microRNA. These are encoded by the genome. They're very small RNAs and they lead to translation or repression or degradation. So what happens with the pre-microRNA pre is that it's processed out of a hairpin-like precursor, and it is complementary, almost, well, part of it is complementary to selected mRNAs. And when it binds, when a single-stranded molecule binds there, it can either block translation or lead to degradation. So these teeny little microRNAs are very important, play very important regulatory roles. Okay, so the other one that I'd like to talk about a little bit more is the formation of M6A, which is N6-methyl adenosine. Now, we saw M6A already as a potential um, um, modification that occurs at the 5' prime end as part of the cap structure. But this modified adenosine can also occur at other locations within the mRNA where a methyl group is added to selective adenosines, and this can have a myriad of effects on the final fate of that particular RNA. So the actual preferred sequence is GGACU, where the adenosine in the middle is the one that's methylated. But this sequence occurs many times within the mRNA mostly, and only a small proportion of those are actually methylated. Okay, so here's a picture of M6A. It's a regular adenine, but it has this additional methyl group on, on its amino group. And this serves as a signal that targets different types of processes which follow it. Okay, so here's a sort of, in a nutshell, summary of this very complex system. OK, 
Okay, so what happens first is the M6A is created by a methylase that uses a methyl donor, s adenosylmethionine to modify or methylate the amino group on the adenosine base. Okay, that is METTL3, METTL14 complex. This is actually reversible. So METTL3 is considered a writer in that it puts the mark on the mRNA. Okay, the readers are what determine the fate. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. So what happens as a result of the modification depends on the reader itself and what it controls. So you have different readers that can dictate export, splicing, translation, stability, or, lo or localization of the mRNA. Okay, so the reader proteins, we're only going to talk about a few of them. For example, the YGHDC1 reader binds to the methyl group, and it regulates splicing in part. Then we have YTHDF1 modifies translation or regulates translation of the RNA. And then we have YTHDF2, which guarantees stability or lack thereof of the particular RNA. So the mark is deposited, but the reader determines the fate or the effect that that modification is going to have on that particular mRNA. So for example, YTFDF1 promotes translation, and we know somewhat how that works. It interacts with translation initiation factors. So in this diagram, we have a methyl group near the three prime, in the, within the three prime untranslated region. The YTHDF1 binds, and as a result of that binding, there's an interaction with proteins that bind near the 5 prime end, specifically eukaryotic initiation factors that will then recruit ribosomes to encourage translation of that particular mRNA to occur. So in the absence of that methylation, translation occurs, but not nearly at the same rate. Okay, so how things get the 3 prime end can interact at the 5 prime end is kind of mind boggling, but it is certainly believed that proteins bound to the 3 prime region can form a sort of loop structure where proteins can interact with those that are bound to the 5 prime end. And these structures have been seen. So what's happening is the YTFDH1 is interacting with initiation factors to promote translation of that particular mRNA. Okay, so YTF, YTHDF2 promotes degradation. And again, what does that by interacting with protein complexes that carry out that reaction? So if it interacts with the deadenylation complex, it can recruit the deadenylation complex to the three prime end of the mRNA, thereby causing it to be degraded as one type of mechanism that's associated here. So it, installing the methylation is only the first step. The fate is determined by the reader proteins, which then recruit other downstream complexes. Okay, so the reason these things are important is that perturbation of these processes will lead to global changes in RNA populations, and that can have dire, dire consequences. These sorts of modifications are essential, for example, for embryonic development in, in mouse zebrafish plants, knocking them out as lethal. You can also have modifications associated with various diseases, including neurological diseases and many types of cancer. Okay, so our next topic of the day will be RNA editing in brief. Okay, so RNAs can be modified in ways that actually um, change their interactions with other um, nucleic acids, and including the formation of proteins. So we're going to talk about adenosine to inosine editing by adenosine deaminases briefly, and also briefly um, cytosine and uracil editing by citidine deaminases. These are um, called apobec enzymes. Okay, here's inosine, right. Inosine is formed by removal of the amino group from the purine of adenine, right? So this NH2 is removed, deaminated, and that leaves the C double bond O at the same position. Okay, so that nucleus, nucleotide, nucleoside is called inosine. The base is called hypoxanthine, just to confuse us. And importantly, inosine has very different base pairing properties as from adenine, as you can imagine, with the replacement of that amino group. 
Okay, so one thing that's going to be confusing here, there are all kinds of different adenosine deaminases. Okay, before we get into the ADAR ones, the ones that interact with RNA, I want to remind you that there is a metabolic adenosine deaminase that's responsible for purine degradation and recycling. It functions in a purine salvage pathway. Its substrate is free nucleosides, not RNA. It's not involved in RNA editing, but it's still an enzyme. Defects do lead to severe genetic disease, namely immune system dysfunction. Okay, so don't confuse the metabolic adenosine deaminase at ADA with the other ones that we're going to be talking about shortly. Okay. All right, so inosine occurs in tRNAs, and again, this, isn't, this is not editing in the mRNA sense, but I realize that editing can occur in tRNAs as well. Okay, so inosine does occur in the anticodon positions and elsewhere in some of the tRNAs. And the enzymes that modify adenosine in that setting are the ADAT, adenosine deaminases acting on tRNA. And as a result of this modification, which we mentioned earlier, this allows a, can allow a particular tRNA to read more than one codon. Okay, so this is not the only form of wobble pairing or strange base pairing that occurs between the codon and the anticodon. But this is not the mRNA editing we're going to be talking about shortly. Okay, so you've seen this picture before. It's a glycyl tRNA where at the wobble position, the adenosine has been replaced by an inosine. As a result of that change, the, the tRNA, that particular tRNA can read three different glycine codons because the inosine can pair in the codon-anticodon setting with uracil, cytosine, or adenine. Okay, so finally, we have the ADAR enzymes that I really want to talk about, which are the ones that act on RNA. Okay, so these convert adenosine to inosine within mRNAs, microRNAs, and long non-coding RNAs. The substrates for this reaction are generally double-stranded RNA structures within the RNA. And people have three different ADAR enzymes, ADAR1, ADAR2, and ADAR3. The ADAR3, oddly, is not catalytically active. Okay. Now, in mammals, very few edited sites are actually in protein coding regions. Many or many more are in non-coding regions. But we're going to focus on the ones in coding regions for now, because those are the ones that have very definite changes in the properties of the protein that result. Okay, important idea is how this RNA editing can be observed. Okay, now Inosine base pairs in the, in, in the mRNA context, base pairs like a G instead of an A. Okay, so that's an important central idea. It will, therefore, the it, inosine will then base pair with a C, not with a U or T. Okay, so this difference causes the inosine to be seen by the translation machinery, also by reverse transcriptase, and also the splicing machinery, as a G. So changing an A to a G, in essence, can change many aspects of the RNA life cycle. Okay, so we're going to see our editing events as the appearance of a, apparently a G, even though it's not really a G, in different settings. Okay, so here's our adenine to inosine conversion. Here we have adenosine. We can see that it base pairs with uridine, as you would expect. All right, but inosine base pairs with cytosine, behaving in this setting as a G. It's not quite a G, but it's close enough that that is how it is seen by various biological molecules. Okay, so the first editing was observed, or can be observed really, by comparing DNA sequence, the original genomic DNA sequence, with the sequences of cDNAs that are prepared by reverse transcription of mRNAs. So in this particular group, we have red sequences which are all DNA sequences acquired from genomic DNA. And the blue ones are RNA sequences, but they're cDNA sequences that were prepared by reverse transcription. So you can see the highlighted A in the genomic DNA, but then when you look at the cDNA, most of the time it's a G. The occasional A still remains. So editing in this setting is not absolute. It's, not, it's very strong, but it's not absolute. In the other example, we have the um, 
uh, less strongly edited, proportionally less. There's an A in the genomic DNA, which appears some of the time as a G in the cDNA, but not always. So that would represent a weaker editing site where it's sometimes edited and sometimes not. Okay, don't be confused by the SNP on the same picture. Okay, again, the inosine is read as a G, and this can cause amino acid changes in proteins when they're part of the coding region, right? If you change your mRNA sequence, you are going to be potentially changing the amino acid sequences, amino acids that will be translated from those mRNAs. Okay, so we're going to look at the occurrence of I nucleotides and examples where they actually lead to the change in amino acid sequence. Okay, so for our sequencing worksheet, we're going to do much more of this next time. Um, we're going to create a scenario where we have three code, uh, a set of codons, CAA, CAG, CAC, and CAT, and we will then edit the central A to see what the effects are on the protein sequence with reference to our genetic code. All right, so we look at our genetic code, and we can see that CAT is histidine, CAC is histidine, CAA is glutamine, and CAG is glutamine. So in order to say, okay, we're editing this, we take that A, change it to an I, read it as a G, and what we know is we then get arginine codons. The CAT becomes essentially CGT, the CAC becomes CGC, etc. And same with the glutamine. So in these two, in these examples, the histidine will, uh, the intended histidine, original histidine, will show up as an arginine in the protein, as will this glutamine then show up as an arginine in the protein as a result of that change. Okay, so I can go through these one at a time, and you can see, yes, these all end up being glutamine as a result of the deamination of that central adenosine um, to produce, um, an, 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 well, an inosine, which is read as a gene. Okay, second question, same idea. We have an ATG, which is going to be modified, and that's A is going to become a G, or essentially a G. It's going to become an inosine, which is read as a G, and that gives us ITG, which is read, read as valine. So that editing event can create a valine where the methionine used to be in the protein. Okay, again, we need to refer to our genetic code for all of these. Okay, there's some many famous examples of these, and they very prevalent in the nervous system of Drosophila, where they change things like serotonin receptors, um, glutamate-sensitive calcium ion, ion channels, etc. Now, most of the editing sites in humans are not within coding regions. They are more likely in three prime untranslated regions, where they're going to Im impact um, binding of microRNAs. Okay, but in some organisms, namely squid and octopus, octopus this form of edit is actually used extremely extensively. Okay, so here's some pictures we'll talk about next time. The editing substrate is actually a double-stranded RNA, and in these examples, the exon is actually base paired to the adjacent intron. So the, the ed editing has to occur before splicing because the intron is still there. So this double-stranded structure is what guides the ADAR to the site to be edited with the result that you have amino acid changes or can have amino acid changes within the eventual protein that's produced. Okay, here's another example, which we will detail at a different time.